moment to tell you a little bit about David Green, for whom this lectureship is named. Um, I'm familiar with his work, or I was familiar with his work on beta oxidation of fatty acids, but I, I didn't know that much about him, so I did a little bit of research. And I'd just like to give you an overview. He's a remarkable um, biochemist. He was an American biochemist. He was born in New York City, trained in Cambridge, and then uh, brought kind of state-of-the-art enzymology back to the U.S. in the early 40s, and uh, was first a research fellow at Harvard, and then was uh, an instructor and later an associate professor at the medical school, the Columbia Medical School. And he was invited to Madison to really start the first, or to start the first, research group at the Enzyme Institute. And uh, I'd like to read this quote to you. This is from his obituary, which was co-written by Helmut Weiner. He said, Green, therefore, was a logical choice to be invited to head the first research group at the Institute for Enzyme Research at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, an institution conceived by far-sighted biochemists in Madison who felt that the tradition of the great biochemical research laboratories of war-torn Europe, such as those at Cambridge, Berlin, or Heidelberg, now had to be continued in the new world. This is the, the great part. It says, Green accepted this post at what, at that time, must have appeared to a born New Yorker educated in Cambridge as a far outpost of civilization. <laughs> um, at Madison, or initially at, at Columbia, then uh, at Madison, he did uh, really pioneering work on fit, uh, fatty acid beta oxidation, which I mentioned, but also the design of ways to, methods to dissociate, uh, purify, and reassemble enzyme systems. He worked on oxidoreductases. Uh, he worked on the role of non-heme iron and copper in the respiratory chain. Or the respiratory chain. <coughs> And he discovered the role of ubiquinone in mitochondrial respiration. But he was quite the pioneer. And um, I'd like to introduce another pioneer today to you, which is today's speaker, Jason Kosla, who is the Wells H. Rouser and Harold M. Hedekrim professor in the School of Engineering at Stanford University. Uh, professor Kosla is the chair of chemical engineering and has uh, appointments as well in chemistry and biochemistry. He received his PhD with John Bailey at Caltech and then was a postdoc um, at the John Innes Center in the UK. Uh, over the course of his not very long career, uh, he's received many awards. Um, those include from the American Chemical Society, the uh, Pure Chemistry Award and the Cold Scholar Award. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 2009, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering. I, I know uh, Chaitin's work best. Um, his research on um, the entomology and the re-engineering of polyketide synthases. Um, these are modular enzymes, uh, modular enzyme complexes that synthesize polyketides and if you're not familiar with polyketides, this is a class of natural products that have a wide variety of biological rules and uh, pharmacological uh, properties. So with that, I'd like to welcome Jason uh, to Wisconsin Madison to give a seminar today uh, discussing the modularity of polyketide synthesis 20 years on. Jason. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for your can you hear me back there? No. Uh, 
metabolism, but other than that, obviously, I did not overlap with him at all. Uh, I did, however, uh, at the time when uh, I accepted Doug's kind invitation to give this lecture, uh, I think it was uh, early, early summer, uh, one of the first things I did was contact another colleague of yours, uh, Dick Hutchinson, uh, uh, who has been a long-standing source of inspiration, advice, friendship, uh, and a lot of really outstanding science over the years. And I suggested to him that we use this opportunity. Uh, Hutch was... Uh, 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 a diehard Wisconsin city, and he would never cease to use the opportunity to uh, to brag about Wisconsin winter. And since I knew I was going to be here in the heart of winter, I suggested to Hutch that I would come out the day before so he and I could spend uh, uh, the day by your beautiful lake and he could introduce me to some of the flavors of a uh, two foot thick uh, uh, layer of ice on a lake. Uh, unfortunately, as you also know, that did not uh, come to pass uh, because uh, earlier this year, uh, Dick Hutchinson passed away uh, of metastatic cancer. And so, with the permission of your faculty, I have chosen to dedicate this lecture to Dick Hutchinson. It is not the typical lecture I do. And for those of you who came here uh, wanting to see the latest data on the enzymology of polytypes and faces, I apologize. It may not be here. But I thought, nonetheless, this could provide a useful teaching moment uh, for those of you who may be interested in the recent history of a field that obviously has been very close to my heart over the past 20 years, but was certainly defined <coughs> by this one giant uh, in the past 20 years. As I was trying to think of how I could prepare a lecture that would be both uh, informative to a sophisticated biochemical audience like this, but also uh, uh, allow me to do what I felt was appropriate on a day like this. Uh, I thought back to uh, another similar occasion recently, uh, a couple of years ago, when my colleague Arthur Kornberg passed away. Uh, and the faculty in the biochemistry department uh, decided to do a very unusual celebration of Arthur's science, which uh, in my experience of having attended some of these posthumous celebrations was unquestionably the most enjoyable uh, of those celebrations. What we basically <coughs> did was we took an entire day out of our calendars and spent the entire day, faculty and students huddled in a small lecture hall and did a journal club on 20 of Arthur's papers over the past six decades of his science. And that was perhaps one of the most enjoyable experiences. And so I decided I would use that theme to honor Hutch today. Uh, what I have done in my lecture for my lecture today is chosen four or five papers from Hutch's past 25 years of science, and I will use them to motivate things that we did in our labs and how what Hutch did in his science influenced the, the direction of our own research. These are the four natural products that Hutch worked on over the years that uh, I will be drawing from his literature on. And so, for those of you who've never seen a polyketide before, you're looking at four very beautiful examples of polyketide antibiotics right here. So, the first paper I picked was a paper that Hutch published in 1989. It was one of two back-to-back -back papers 
that came out uh, uh, where, where, Hutch, where one of them was from Hutch's lab and it was actually quite informative of Hutch's uh, uh, style of doing science. He really did believe that uh, even when one competed in science, science won when people collaborated even as competitors. And this notion of putting a back-to-back -back, uh, paper with his arch competitor, peer, uh, but also a friend, uh, David Hopwood, who was my postdoctoral mentor, was very typical of, of, of Hutch's um, character. Uh, this paper basically broke, it would be an under statement to say that this paper broke new ground because it did a lot more than break new ground. It brought at least 50, maybe 100 years of natural product chemistry uh, around polyketide antibiotics. In one paper, it brought it into the world of biochemistry. And more specifically, <coughs> what Hutch did was he had cloned, he went five years before this, he went to Norwich, England to learn genetics long before most chemists could even spell genetics. Uh, Hutch made a leap into the world of genetics uh, and did so with quite a bit of flair. He got back to Madison and launched and realized that the only way he would be able to make further advances in the biosynthesis of the tetracinomycins, which were antibiotics he was interested in for a while, was to look at the genetics of these biosynthetic pathways. And this paper basically described the cloning and sequencing of the core polyketide pathway <coughs> within the tetracinomycin biosynthetic pathway. And specifically, what Hutch observed in this study was that the enzymes that made this polyfunctional aromatic antibiotic called tetracinomycin were basically very close relatives of the enzymes involved in fatty acid biosynthesis. Specifically, he observed a small protein called an acyl carrier protein, and he observed a condensing enzyme that forms a carbon-carbon bond between and electrophilic diester and nucleophilic malonate extender shown over here, that would be a condensing enzyme or a ketosynthase. And he proposed using the well-known chemistry of fatty acid biosynthesis, an analogous pathway that would build up the carbon skeleton and subsequently cyclize it into the first isolable precursor of the tetracinomycin antibiotics. And I've highlighted this sentence over here because I think if there was one sentence in this paper where that demonstrated the man's vision about where this field was headed, uh, it would be this sentence uh, where he was persuaded that this would be the beginning of what, what, what today we know as multi-enzyme assembly line antibiotic biosynthesis. Uh, and I think this was really far-reaching back then. It would not be an understatement to say that this paper, together with its companion paper, were the two papers that inspired me as I decided my, to take my own career in the direction of antibiotic biosynthesis coming out of graduate school. Uh, Hutch was persuaded very early on, before there was any direct data, that uh, these enzymes would be working like a complex. In fact, this is a paper with uh, your now colleague, Ben Shin, when Ben was a postdoc with Hutch, that illustrates that about as vividly as vivid gets. He basically characterized this system, this polyketide synthase, as a heterodimeric ketosynthase onto which this little acyl carrier protein would come and set to be able to go through a series of reactions. Uh, so you've got 
a thiol on a benzene arm over here. You've got an active site cysteine over here. Uh, at that time, he had it wrong about where this nucleophilic transferase was, but that's a relatively minor detail in this, uh, in this overall pathway. But basically, he had gotten these two active sites right on the money, and he had predicted that these things would come together to form this complex. You would have your malonate attached to the, this carrier protein thiol. You would have your first acetyl unit anchored on the active site over here. Carbon-carbon bond formation would happen. And now you would be set up to go through this cycle again as many times as it took to build this de decaketide chain, which would then be cyclized, aromatized, and eliminated from the system into this compound. So this thing that these systems would sit together and assemble into complexes, into assemblies, and do this assembly line biosynthesis was very, uh, very uh, close. Well, he, was, he was absolutely convinced by the early 1990s that that's how these enzymes work. Uh, to my knowledge, this represented the first uh, feeble direct evidence in the literature for the existence of these assemblies, uh, these covalent complexes. This was an experiment that your Dreyer did in my laboratory in the late 1990s, where essentially what he did was he titrated in an APO, acyl carrier protein, a carrier protein without a pantothion arm, and showed that it was a competitive inhibitor of the polyketide synthase with a KI on the order of the KM, the apparent KM of the holo protein. So uh, when uh, Jörg sent this paper in for, uh, to JDC. There was other data in this paper too, but the, one of the reviewers just did not like this paper and the fact that there were only three points on this graph that we used to calculate the KI and there was no 4x4 four four plot and so on and so forth. And there was a very good chance that that paper would not have been accepted in, uh, in the literature. But in his characteristic style, Hutch wrote the second review of the paper. And he anticipated what the first reviewer would say. And he preempted a lot of what the first reviewer's concerns were. And then he went on to explain why it is so hard to do these experiments because you get such little quantities of this polyketide synthase out of these enzyme systems. And he signed his review, Hutch, as he often did. Uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that that paper was published because of Hutch's generosity of spirit at that point in time. Of course, several years later, Yi Tang came to my lab and did the experiments the way uh, self-respecting biochemists would want them done. Uh, he took the actinorodin octaketide polyketide <coughs> synthase, uh, the tetracinomycin synthase, titrated in a whole bunch of different carrier proteins and showed that there was specificity in this chemistry, in this biochemistry for the actual protein part. You can just, I'll just draw your attention, for example, to these KCAT over KM parameters. And you can see that for a given ketosynthase, as you change the identity of the carrier protein, uh, even though the rest of the chemistry that it's doing is identical, there are at least two logs worth of differences in the rates of the reaction simply as a function of the identity of the protein. So uh, 10 years after Hutch's, uh, Hutch's uh, insight that these things would assemble, this, the, the case has been quite well. There, there, there are many other experiments in the literature by now that make the case. So fast forward today, this is how we know the pathways like the, uh, here I have shown uh, the catalytic cycle for the 
the, the pathway of the actin or rodent synthase that was the companion paper to the tetracinomycin synthase paper that I initially alluded you to. And we understand this pathway. We have crystal structures, high resolution crystal structures of pretty much, or NMR structures of pretty much all the proteins in this pathway. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, now I can walk you through perhaps the pathway a little bit better. You start with this carrier protein over here with its pentathion arm thiol. There is an enzyme that is literally borrowed from the fatty acid synthase, a malonyl coa acyl transferase that takes the malonyl group from coenzyme A attaches it on to this carrier protein associated in a dedicated manner with this polyketide synthase. And now you are set up for priming the system. This is the one thing that Hutch didn't quite pick up from his earlier analysis, but soon recognized later on, uh, that the priming of the system essentially happens by decarboxylation of a malonyl extender in the active site of the chemosynthase. So essentially, the initiation reaction is, and is involves the entry of this nucleophile into this active site. Since there's nothing for a carbon-carbon bond formation, to, uh, there's no thioester attached in this active site at the thiol. Uh, you end up decarboxylating this. It protonates, it quenches to an acetyl group. The acetyl group now transfers onto the thiol, and now you have a prime ketosynthase. You have another copy of this extender unit that comes in. That's generated by the same fast pathway over here. You now have a nucleophile and an electrophile sitting next to each other in the active site. The carbon carbon, this carbon carbon bond forms. You have a diketide, a beta ketoester that forms. And importantly, and this is the key observation that allowed Hutch and us to be able to mechanistically differentiate the assembly line synthesis that I'll be talking about in a little bit with this transfer of intermediates to this recycling that this carrier protein leaves after it returns the ketide unit back to this active site. A new carrier protein comes in with one more. You have elongation, and finally you have the chain that forms, and that's what releases. So this pathway by now is fairly well established, notwithstanding the highly reactive nature of these intermediates. Be as these enzymological investigations were going on, uh, the, the the pioneering observations that Hutch made about these, about the tetracinomycin synthase, the associated enzymes, as well as the companion observations that were made in by looking at the genetics of the actin eroding polyketide synthase, allowed Bob McDaniel in my lab, my first graduate student, to start doing comparative studies on the molecular recognition features of these different enzymes. And over a relatively short period, again, thanks to the generosity of Hutch's lab for having given us access to a variety. At this day and age, you never think about these things. Because when you need a gene, you just call out some DNA synthesizing facility, and next day your gene shows up. Back then, the only way you could do these kinds of experiments is if you had good enough relationships with the people who originally characterized them. And in that context, I'm extremely grateful that Hutch was able to give us access to these genes that he had painstakingly cloned so we could do a comparative molecular recognition analysis of the actin rodent enzymes, the tetracinomycin enzymes, characterize their chain length specificity, their keto reduction specificity, their cyclization specificity for these reactive polybeta keto intermediates, how they aromatize, and so on. And in the course of these studies, Bob McDaniel was able to develop some kind of, shall we say, design rules for these kinds of molecules. And these design rules had obvious engineering implications, because by then, the third and the fourth gene clusters of this family had started to be cloned and sequenced. And one could actually visualize how one might be able to use those design rules to do rational engineering 
of polyfunctional aromatic compounds. And so here is an example of a small library of compounds that Bob McDaniel and Hong Fu made in my lab, starting with Hopwood's actin rodent polyketide synthase genes, Hutch's uh, uh, tetracinomycin polyketide synthase genes, and another class of uh, a related uh, polyketide synthase involved in phenolysin biosynthesis, where systematically mixing and matching these genes, one was able to access a variety of compounds that, including some that really didn't have equivalents before in the natural product literature. Uh, so, 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 I think that's 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 one example of uh, uh, how uh, how the early insights from Hutch's lab were able to influence not just mechanism but also engineering of these kinds of antibiotic pathways. Uh, what also became quite clear from these kinds of experiments was that the critical parameter that nature was setting in these kinds of polyketide synthases was the number of cycles a given polyketide synthase would iterate in order to make a highly reactive polybeta keto chain. So Hutch's polyketide synthase iterated nine times with 10 malonal acyl carrier proteins to make these kinds of compounds, C20, 20, 20 carbon compounds. Hopwood's polyketide synthase iterated eight times with eight malonyl coenzyme A equivalents to make this, these two 16 carbon chains, cyclized differently, but nonetheless, they had a very strict substrate specificity. And there was an important question that the field was struggling with what was controlling this chain length specificity at that point in time? So uh, very early on uh, in, these, in these experiments, again, Bob McDaniel did an experiment in my lab where he took Hutch's keto polyketide synthase that made tetracinomycin, Alpha's polyketide synthase that made the actin rodin skeleton, and basically scrambled the three proteins, the keto synthase, the carrier protein, and there was a third protein in there in this minimal polyketide synthase that nobody really knew the function of back then. Uh, but but uh, that he basically made all possible combinations of these hybrid polyketide synthases and characterize the chain lengths of their respond, uh, corresponding products. Uh, and what he, what he observed through this experiment was that for all the products that he was detecting, uh, the chain length specificity basically tracked with the origin of this subunit. Uh, so for example, uh, if you take, let's see, this one over here, uh, this, this particular one. This is basically the tetracinomycin polyketide synthase, but this particular subunit of protein comes from the actinorodin synthase, and that makes a 16 carbon chain. Okay? And so Bob basically called this protein, with David Hopwood's blessing, the chain length factor. And so when the next time I had a chance to meet with Hutch, I introduced to Hutch the concept of a chain length factor. Of course, by then, Hutch had read this paper, and with his characteristic big smile, he looked at me and said, I don't believe it. And I said, why, Hutch? He said, see this column over here? You didn't get a product in here when you combine the tetracinomycin chain length factor with the actin erodin minimum polyketide synthase. When you are able to make a 20 carbon polyketide with the tetracinomycin enzyme over here, come and talk to me. Uh, and he was right. In fairness, in order to be able to definitively call this subunit, 
the chain length determining factor, we should have been able to do both these experiments. And Hutch, this, 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 but this is a characteristic trait of Hutch. He would never settle for anything short of perfect. Well, that was a sufficient challenge to a young upstart assistant professor like me that I'm, several rounds of students and postdocs spent considerable portions of their theses and postdoctoral studies trying to address this specific problem. And it was only about 10 years after those experiments were done when Cheryl Tsai and Yi Tang were both in my lab, they were able to develop an accurate enough molecular model of the active site of that heterodimeric ketosynthase to be able to predict what were the precise residues that were lining this pocket that were dictating the chain and specificity of this enzyme. Uh, they <coughs> made the appropriate mutants, and indeed, this was uh, this, it turned out exactly as they had predicted. So here is the wild-type actin rodent ketosynthase uh, that makes a 16-carbon polyketide chain. Uh, here is the trace of the wild-type tetracinomycin synthase that makes a 20-carbon polyketide chain. And here is the trace of a mutant where only two residues, as predicted by Yi and Cheryl's model, in exclusively residing in this chain length factor subunit. Uh, so both these residues are part of that chain length factor, were changed to their counterparts in the tetracinomycin synthase. And now you can see the major product over here was a 20 carbon polyketide synthase. So basically, this is the actin rodent synthase with just two residues borrowed from the tetracinomycin synthase, both in that chain length factor subunit, and it predominantly makes this C20 product. And importantly, this time they were able to do the reverse experiment, where they were able to introduce just one residue from the tetracinomycin synthase into the actin rodent chain length factor and have it predominantly make uh, the, the, the correct chain length. So uh, this was, the, we were really excited about this. Uh, by then, Hutch was no longer an academic. Hutch was the vice president of uh, uh, of, of research of a biotechnology company in the Bay Area that was developing polyketide drugs called Cosine Biosciences. Hutch had better things to do than read Jack's ASAP by then. Uh, but nonetheless, Hutch did wake up every morning and look at Jack's ASAP. When this, when this accelerated publication came out, when this this, this communication came out in JAX. Hutch was the first person to send me an email saying, I now believe it. Okay? And that, to me, meant a lot. That was a very important acknowledgement from Hutch, and it did mean a lot, especially given that he had very little at that point to do with, uh, with enzymology. Here's another paper of Hutch's that goes way before his before uh, the the field. Uh, by the early 1990s, uh, it could have been even earlier, but certainly by 1990, 1991, Hutch had gotten very excited about the possibility of studying doxorubicin and the biosynthesis of doxorubicin, and uh, he was motivated by that. Ironically, given how his life came to an end by the fact that doxorubicin, even though it was a frontline chemotherapeutic for a variety of, uh, of, of, of cancers, was an extremely expensive agent. And he deely believed that, and that, that studying the biosynthesis, biosynthesis 
of the Anubis and could lead to the, the emergence of better technologies to make uh, Doxorubis. And, and indeed, his lab did develop some very useful technology to be able to enhance the productivity of Doxorubis and that was subsequently licensed to Pharmacia, uh, which was the primary producer of Doxorubis and uh, for improving the yields and productivity of Doxorubis. Uh, but in the course of his studies in Doxorubis and biosynthesis, uh, Hutch made another important discovery with regard to polyketide synthesis. He discovered that, uh, and this was, I should say, not a, a serendipitous discovery. This was, a, this, was a, a, this was anticipated. So he had anticipated that, so this is the structure of the real Doxorubis. He had anticipated that this hydroxyketone moiety was the result of an unusual variation in the catalytic cycle I showed you earlier on for tetracinomycin. So this is also a, a, a depiketide backbone, but it nonetheless comes from one propionate equivalent. So that mechanism of decarboxylated timing that I explained to you earlier on in the context of tetracinomycin could not apply in this system. It had to, there had to be something to actively suppress that decarboxylated priming mechanism. He didn't know what it would be, but nonetheless, when he did the genetics on this pathway, he discovered two critical enzymes. And basically, they turned out to be a dedicated initiating module for polyketide biosynthesis. And this was the first of, of several examples. Subsequently, a number of polyketide biosynthetic pathways were looked at, including in my lab, the biosynthesis of this family of estrogen receptor antagonists called R1128 antibiotics. Uh, and that also have these unusual appendages. And indeed, uh, it became clear by looking at these and a variety of other ones that nature had developed, this was sort of the first step in nature's armamentarium to start evolving to more and more complex polyketide synthases. In the sense that if you saw the tetracinomycin synthase as basically this pathway over here that just goes round and round several times to make a backbone, what nature had done in the context of Dr. Rubison or uh, R1128 in our case, had tacked onto that an, an additional module of polyketide synthase enzymes, where now the catalytic cycle starts with the priming of this dedicated keto synthase with some random coenzyme A precursor that exists in the cell, not randomly, as dictated by the molecular recognition features of this enzyme, you now have, well, in, in Hutch's case, say, a propionyl uh, 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 enzyme adduct, or in our case, a variety of other, depending upon what these, the, the identity of these precursors was. This goes through one round of elongation, followed by a full set of reductive enzymes that reduce this into an alkyl chain, and then this this the carrier protein that's part of this module passes this alkyl precursor onto that heterodimeric ketosynthase that I was talking to you about earlier on. And now this guy takes on, goes through as many rounds as its chain length specificity factor dictates, and out comes the desired problem. <coughs> so now you have the, the beginnings of a mechanism from nature that allows you to do something that would be chemically virtually impossible. To take a polyketide antibiotic, say like this, and be able to functionalize an inert methyl group in an otherwise functionalized polyketide chain to make some kind of other modification at this position. This would be a chemically virtually impossible thing to do in a molecule of this sort, but nature had figured out how to do it using the polyketide principles. And so again, the question come, came up, 
how could you use the insights of this, uh, this kind of a bimodular synthase to be able to develop rational design rules for being able to take an antibiotic of this sort or a natural product of this sort and read your selectively functionalized an inert methyl group over here. Uh, so the answer to that came in two steps. The first step was to be able to get the recognition features of the carrier proteins and the condensing enzymes set up in such a way so that you could have an initiation module that would talk to the elongation module that makes this molecule. So you've got an elongation module over here with a ketoreductase that makes this molecule. You want to append on to its front end an initiation module of polypeptide synthase subunits so that that would feed in the desired functional group, the alkyl functional group that you want to put in instead of the methyl chain. And that would be taken up over here. But if that's the only thing you do. You recombine two modules where nature had only one, you're going to end up with a molecule that does have an alkyl appendage, but is not the analog you were looking to rationally produce, which would be functional lies over here. And the reason for that is because the chain length factor of this module is reading carbon atoms, not the number of condensation cycles that are going through. And so by adding this extra fluff over here, you have gotten this polyketide synthase to truncate the number of condensation cycles it is going to do. So if you do want to design a molecule which is functionalized over here, you want to make two changes. Not just figure out how to add both on the front end, this initiation module to here, but you need to be able to replace the chain length function over here so that now you have, let's say you're going to introduce a butyryl unit or a pentanoid unit over here in place of an acetyl unit. You now need to have a chain length function over here that would be a decaketide equivalent instead of an octaketide equivalent. So you need to give two extra ketides in that chain length pocket so you can essentially have this molecule, this alkyl group incorporated, the bulkier group, and at the same time go through uh, seven rounds of condensation so that the reactive portion of the molecule is set up for cyclization and modification in this way. So, so, so basically the principles that came out of Hutchinson's studies on the, on the doxorubicin synthase had direct uh, engineering implications, if you will, for rational molecular engineering. And since then, a variety of modified compounds have been made, some of which are shown over here, where you can systematically, using this principle, modify with your favorite alkyl groups what would otherwise be an invariant method in these molecules. How am I doing for time? Do I have about 10 minutes more? Okay. Let me tell you one more short story, and then I'm going to tell you about the experiment that Menta Hatch was for. Uh, so, by, I don't know, Ben, you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong, but by about 1997, Hatch was excited about a new antibiotic that he was interested in. Well, it's an old antibiotic, but he was excited about studying the biosynthesis of Frederica Meissen. I still remember the email he sent me and when he decided he was going to launch into this. He called that email. He had, he had this characteristic tendency to use very graphic one-word or two-word titles to his emails. Most of us, when we're writing an email to somebody, what do we do? We just like put the, we, we struggle to find the right title for an email and just put any garbage that we can find in that email header, knowing that nobody reads those anyway. But Hutch used to find ways to annotate his emails with very interesting titles. This title came to me as Big Key Time. It was a word that told me exactly what Hutch was going to do. He was going to clone and characterize the polyketide synthase 
that made the longest damn chain that nature could ever make. So he had looked at, done the retrobiosynthetic analysis on this polyketide pathway, and, and, and he was persuaded that this could derive from a 15 acetyl equivalent, so a C30 polyketide chain, and 15 malonal equivalents, and therefore he was going to call it the big ketide. Of course, uh, shortly after he started studying this pathway, he moved on to greener pastures, uh, uh, California. Uh, well, not really green anymore, but, but he moved on. And this project lay fallow until your colleague Ben Shen came here and had the courage to pick it up and study this pathway in all its glory. And so by uh, about probably close to 10 years after he started studies on this pathway, Ben, together with Hutch, put out the seminal paper that characterizes the Frederica Meissen biosynthetic pathway. I have nothing to say about the Frederica Meissen biosynthetic pathway, but it did influence something that, that that, that's a very uh, thought-provoking experiment that's been going on in my lab from a completely different direction. <clears throat> uh, about three years ago, uh, we got interested in this polyketide that was reported by a group of researchers at Sankyo Labs, primarily because of its very interesting pharmacological properties. It is a specific inhibitor of <coughs> an enzyme that plays a critical role in the potentiation of the gamma interferon pathway. And as such, I'm sorry, the alpha interferon pathway, not gamma interferon pathway. And as such, has presents a fundamentally new mechanism for antiviral chemotherapy. Uh, a kind of mechanism that, uh, that, that is devoid of many of the toxicological issues associated with nucleoside and non-nucleoside antiviral therapeutics. And so we got interested in this polyketide. It also represents a fundamentally unprecedented chemotype, and that was also motivating to us. And so Kate Zaleta and Lu Charcutian in my lab over the past uh, couple of years have cloned and sequenced and characterized and heterogeneously expressed this pathway and done all the things that nowadays we all take for granted. Uh, and they have a pathway to propose for their, uh, their, their, their natural product. And that starts basically with the same C30 big ketide that Hutch's Frederica Meissen pathway started with. But what's really surprising about this pathway is when you look at the gene cluster that makes A74528 up here, and you look at Ben and Hutch's Frederica Meissen pathway, they're basically N4 and identical. They have greater than 75% identity in every gene down the rank, except for this one gene out here, which is absent in the Frederica Meissen gene cluster. So in the past 20 years, I can't tell you how many times I have been asked the question, what good are all these engineered polyketides that you make for? Uh, what use do they, they probably all represent waste products, things that nature experimented with a long time ago and disposed of because they had no real utility uh, in, to biology. Uh, I'm not sure I believe that or I didn't believe that, but it, uh, I think it accept, uh, I think what you have to accept that when you don't have the data to counter somebody, you've got to accept that they may have a point. Uh, I think this clearly puts that argument to rest. You've got one enzyme pathway, one gene cluster that puts out two totally different antibiotics, both of which have two totally different pharmacological behavior. Basically, out of a common This isn't repurposing antibiotic biosynthesis in a modular fashion. I don't know what it is. Uh, and I think it's fair to say we would not have been here in such a short period of time in the studies of this pathway were it not for Hutch's big ketide discovery. 
Let me conclude with this last paper of Hutchins, because if you pushed me against the wall and said, pick one paper that Hutch wrote that changed people's thinking more than any other, I would probably, unless I was very drunk, in which case I would pick the first one that I showed you, but I would probably pick this. Uh, because this was a very important paper. It was published in 1987, and again, in Hutch's characteristic style, this paper was published back to back with a similar paper. Hutch was studying Tylactone, which is the antibiotic precursor of the antibiotic, which is the macrolide precursor of the antibiotic tylosin. And David Kane was studying erythronolide, which is the macrolide precursor of the, of the antibiotic erythromycin. And they published two back-to-back -back papers that were very consonant in terms of the key message. What was the message? So by then, even though nobody knew what these polyketide synthases would look like, people had a pretty good idea that these polyketide synth polyketides were derived from fatty acid-like acyl-CoA types of mechanisms. Uh, but there were two questions when you moved from something as simple and functionally boring as a fatty acid to something as complex as tylactone. Since this is a crummy slide uh, in terms of resolution, no, no offense to Hutch, of course, but uh, there's only so much you can do with these horrible ACS scans from past uh, old papers. Uh, there were, so when you look at a molecule like tylactone, which is what Hutch worked on uh, in this study, uh, it is not at all obvious how such exquisite and rich functionality in stereochemistry could have arisen from, uh, from, from something as boring as a fatty acid synthase gone awry. And so there were two models back then that uh, people struggled with about how this functionality in stereochemistry would be introduced. One model was that uh, you would have your acetyl propionyl butyryl units uh, oligomerized in a, in a predictable fashion by, uh, by, by uh, say, the tylactone synthase, whatever that was going to look like, into this poly beta keto chain with the appropriate functionality, these methyl branches and ethyl here for good measure and so on and so forth. And then there would be a series of decorative enzymes that would come along, modify this highly reactive poly beta keto intermediate into something that starts to look like tylosin. The other hypothesis was nature would come up with a way that it would do all the chemistry that was required incrementally. So you would have the formation of a diketide, but then you would have this stereocenter and this stereocenter as well as this alcohol functionality set at that point. Then you would go on to make this diketide into a triketide. Again, set the functionality, this olefin over here at that point. Then you would go on make this tetraketide and so on and so forth. Well, of course, sitting where you are today, you know what the answer is. But back then, it was not at all clear what the answer would be. Hutch did that experiment. And specifically, this was the experiment he did. And this was the experiment that David Kane did that was published in parallel. Basically, what Hutch did was he made this triketide and this diketide, this putative precursor. He basically said, if the pathway looks like this, then this would be the triketide intermediate, and this would be the diketide intermediate. Of course, it would be enzyme bound, but guessing that it would be a thioester intermediate, he decided he was going to make a synthetic mimic of the diketide and the triketide. And the question came, how would he activate it so that it would be both cell permeable as well as incorporated, transacylated onto whatever the enzyme looked like. And after that, several false starts, both he and David Kane 
up with using N-acetyl-sustaining thioesters for this. Uh, both of them got incredibly low incorporation of these synthetic precursors into their corresponding macrolide backbones. But they nonetheless were able to show using isotopically labeled intermediates, so I labeled this methyl group because you get a very strong NMR signal for this methyl group or this methyl group in the diketide, so he could pick up this signal uh, by in, in trace quantities, even though he was getting only a couple of percent incorporation of these intermediates. But nonetheless, he was able to show that these were intermediates. David made a doubly labeled intermediate so he could look at, at, at peak splitting patterns in the C13 and more, and that gave him an additional five or, uh, five fold or six fold improvement in resolution to be able to detect the intact incorporation of his intermediates. Importantly, Hutch did a negative control experiment, and this is an important message for every student to take. He actually fed, made and fed this beta, this alpha methyl beta keto ester because this was the expected intermediate on this pathway. David didn't do that experiment. Shame on David. Uh, but Hutch did that experiment, and he showed that while these intermediates incorporated well, the beta diketo intermediate did not incorporate. And I think this was the definitive experiment, in my view, in terms of breaking the 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 the, the breaking our, our logjam in how to think about uh, macrolide biosynthesis. Today, of course, we know that these assembly lines are work from this. So this is the erythronolide synthase that was originally characterized by Peter Ledley and his collaborators in Cambridge and Leonard Katz and his collaborators at Abbott. Uh, but, but back then, we had no idea that this enzyme system would, that, these, that the enzymes that make these kinds of uh, molecules would look like this. And there are some very telling lines that I initially blew up to show you in Hutch's paper, uh, but then realized that nobody, even I, wouldn't be able to read them given how bad they show. But you, I, I strongly recommend that you go and read the last paragraph of this paper, because if there ever was somebody who could have foretold what this field was going to look like, this paper, as well as some few lines in David's paper, although David's papers tend to have other things in them too that are not fit to read. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, but Hutch's paper is really about masterpiece. It's a masterpiece in experimental design. Why and how did that influence my own research? Of course, in many ways, our research. But I'll just tell you about one experiment, and I'll end over here. Uh, so, as I mentioned, these kinds of biosynthetic incorporation experiments back then were great analytical tools to study uh, uh, polyketide biosynthesis mechanisms, but they were hopeless in terms of preparative chemistry. Uh, when John Jacobson came to my lab in the mid-1990s, he basically decided, inspired by Hutch and David's experiment, he was going to try and turn that analytical method into a preparatively useful method. And the way he was going to do it was by essentially using genetic engineering to block the synthase in its first module. So now he could come along and take a synthetic diketide analog, drop it into the fermentation broth. But in contrast to what Hutch and David Cain experienced, where they were competing with the natural pathway in the wild host, now there was no competition for the synthetic intermediate. And so this synthetic intermediate would go to the second module of the erythronolide synthase and be modified. And if you could do that with the natural compound where R1 is normally a methyl group and R2 is normally an ethyl group to make natural erythronolide, why then you could do it with buckyballs or whatever you wanted. And indeed, I was a, I mean, uh, John Jacobson was able to make a variety of compounds modified at the western shore of this molecule in relatively short order in quite respectable quantities. So I was really excited. I was on cloud nine 
in, uh, in 1997 when, uh, when, when John was, was doing this, I ran into Hutch. I told them about what was going on even before, actually this was way back, this was in 1996. I ran into Hutch. Hutch basically thought about that. I think it was on the shores of, uh, of, of your lake out here, although it was in summer. Uh, Hutch thought about that and said, what do you think would happen if you fed this trichetype precursor to the erythronolites and things? Honestly, I hadn't thought about that experiment until then. Uh, it was not at all obvious to me, even after I spent a good half hour thinking about that experiment, what you would get. So I went home, I told Jacobson, Hutch suggested this experiment. Why don't we feed the trichetide from tylosin, which is a 16 carbon, shall we say, a ring expanded macrolide relative to erythromycin. Why don't we feed the trichetide to the erythron, to your blocked erythronolite synthase and see what happens? John looked at me like only a student would, I mean, with, 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 with extreme uh, distaste. Uh, he basically walked me through all the steps that would be required to make this precursor. And then he reminded me that in order to get preparative quantities of the modified compounds out, he would have to do at least a one liter fermentation experiment, which would require on the order of a half a gram of this intermediate. And was I nuts or what to ask him to do such a harebrained experiment? Uh, out here. So, you know how it is, as uh, faculty, we just go back in our office when, uh, when our students tell us we're full of it and we, we try and put our crazy thoughts out of our mind. I did that. Hutch called me up the next day and said, so are you going to do the experiment or not? I said, I can't persuade uh, Jacobson to make, to, to make 500 milligrams of that compound. Hutch hung up. A week later, I get this shipment in my office. Back then, there were not nearly as many, uh, uh, as many constraints on shipping stuff. It basically had a round bottom flask in it that was still glowing from dry ice from having been pulled out from dry, it was, it was just like one of those things that had just been pulled out after God knows how many decades from your freezer that had a Jensen's trichetide in it on the order of 500 milligrams. And there was just one letter, one, one, one piece of paper in this oven, nothing on the flask, and there was just one word, gold. <laughs> I knew exactly what it was. I walked into John's office and I said, here is your 500 milligrams of the trichetide. He was two stand forwards. I reminded him that the way he was going to confirm that this was truly gold was by going and taking an NMR and confirming that this carbon atom was C13 labeled which indeed he did. Within 30 minutes, he was back saying, yes, it is gold, and it is indeed the Hutchinson trichetide. So he did the experiment, and indeed, I mean, this is, this is really the kind of experiment that persuades you that nature really came up with an amazingly modular machine. What you've got over here is a chimeric antibiotic where the left half of it is tylosin, and the right half of it is erythromycin. It basically illustrates that how nature, I mean, you're, you, you can think through for yourself what nature would have to do in order to have converted this polyketide synthase into a tylosin polyketide synthase. So once this was done, John did the reverse experiment where he flipped this one stereo center back to the erythromycin center and this compound incorporated to make an erythromycin molecule. So this set up an amazing paradox for us that took about a good eight years to figure out. And we now know that what this stereocenter does, this, I'm sorry, 
this sterosin, this is the Hutchinson triheat at the gold, relative to this compound where this stereocenter and this in the trichetide has been flipped, is it's not a block. So the module two of the erythronolite synthase, this module does not dislike this in terms of entry. This compound can isolate this module just fine. In fact, it can isolate the module better than its natural substrate. However, this compound cannot undergo carbon-carbon bond formation. In contrast, Hutchinson's triketide can isolate as well as elongate just fine. So somewhere in this active site, which does two distinct reactions in the overall erythromycin polyketide pathway, lies information that allows it to use the differential recognition of this one stereocenter to influence the second, but not the first, reaction in the polyketide pathway. Of course, that is the kind of mystery that the next 20 years of studies on these polyketides and bases will be focused on. In an ordinary circumstance, this would be my first slide of my lecture, because this is where, this is how we currently see the 60 oxyurethanolite B synthase. This structure, uh, this composite, this picture is based on high resolution X ray crystal structural uh, as well as uh, NMR information of about 25% to 30% of the entire 2 plus million Dalton synthase. Uh, but because these systems, these modules are highly repetitive, any given active site in here is about 50% or more identical to any other homolog in the system. It becomes relatively easy to build working models of the entire synthesis. So this is our best guess today of what this enzyme system looks like and how building blocks go in over here, get processed to come out, as macrolides. And this is the kind of model we use today to motivate the kinds of experiments that are ongoing in my lab, but that's uh, a different story. Again, I want to thank you for inviting me out here. I apologize. This has gone on a bit longer than you wanted it to go on, but it would be remiss on my, I would be remiss if I did not one more time acknowledge Dick Hutchinson a finer natural product chemist there really has been, and also a very, very enlightened person. Uh, somebody who has been helpful, friendly, visionary to a number of people, myself included. And I think this picture is the picture that I was hoping Hutch would help me experience had he still been around today. It hung outside his office in California for about five years. Uh, I loved it. Every time I'd look at him in the thick of California winter, he would talk about what life was really like in Wisconsin. And he certainly was uh, uh, a brilliant son of your fine state and a brilliant citizen of your fine university. So with that, I salute Hutch one more time, and thank you for your attention.
Absolutely. 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 Okay. Absolutely. It is exactly like Weizmann's back. Yes. I, I have a question. Uh, you said that if, if you were to take uh, an antibiotic from your experience in the, in the area and were to re engineer the pathway mm -hmm. just randomly mm -hmm. with a shovel, mm -hmm. what is the best enhancement you, you've seen on antibiotic activity from the secondary metabolites that are produced? Well, uh, you would be. Okay, let me just make sure I understand your question. Do you want to re-engineer it by just completely scrambling everything, or do you want to take specific enzymes that control specific functional groups and re-engineer them to be able to introduce alternative functional groups? So do you want to do medicinal chemistry on the natural product, or do you want to make garbage? No, just, just make every possible component okay. Uh, you're, it's not, it's lower than one in a thousand. Because by now, the field's probably made over a thousand of natural, natural products, none of which are markedly superior to the current antibiotics, using that kind of approach. But if you do it in a directed fashion, then you've got a reasonable shot at making an improved antibiotic. And what's the, what's the kind of gain in it depends. It depends what you're trying to do. So probably a good example, given what I just told you, is to, so the Jacob, actually this is interesting. This experiment was done when Hutch was the research vice president at COSIN. Johnson & Johnson wanted an analog of erythromycin that had significantly superior lung pharmacokinetics. What Hutch championed was the biosynthesis of 15 fluoro erythromycin, knowing the, uh, he scaled that compound up to one kilo, to a point where he was able to show in, in grown dog and non-human primate that you had significantly improved pharmacokinetics. I forget what the number was, but the half-life of that compound compared to a erythromycin in lung alveolar cells went up dramatically. So, so there you're doing a very predictable thing because, I mean, very rational thing because you know quite a bit about the role of fluorine in medicinal chemistry. You want, nature doesn't waste much effort putting fluorine willy-nilly in natural products, and so you're basically putting a fluorine into the molecule. Okay, so there are no more questions. Let's thank Jaden one more time.